Hello and welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's lecture, which is sponsored by Harvard's Collection of Historical Scientific Instruments and the Harvard Museum of Science and Culture. And I'm also uh, especially delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Matthew Hirsch. Matthew is an associate professor in the history of science at Harvard University, and he specializes in the history of aerospace technology. He's a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he has a law degree from New York University and a doctorate in history and sociology of science from the University of Pennsylvania. And at University of Pennsylvania, he later taught in the School of Arts and Sciences and the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. He's had fellowships in history and space technology at the Smithsonian Institute, at NASA, the Huntington, University of South Carolina, and Columbia University. Matthew's also the author of a book called Inventing the American Astronaut. He co-authored the second edition of The Social History of American Technology, which is a renewed classic. Uh, and most recently, co-editor has been the co-editor of a book called War and Peace in Outer Space, Law, Policy, and Ethics. And now he's completing a new book uh, manuscript for MIT Press called Dark Star, The New History of the Space Shuttle. So basically, if you want to hear about space history, Matthew's the, the person to talk to. So tonight, we'll be welcoming him to mark the, the 60th anniversary of the first American in space. And we'll be hearing about the events of Alan Shepard's flight, how he became an archetype for American astronauts, and how he and others have been chosen to go to space. So if you're hoping to be an astronaut, uh, make sure you listen up for tips. But either way, whether you want to be an astronaut or not, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Matthew Hirsch. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, and thank you to the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, and I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't bring along some images to talk about this very fascinating topic. So I hope everyone can hear me uh, because I'm about to tell you a fascinating story. It was only nine o'clock in the morning on a warm spring day in Cape Canaveral, Florida, and 37-year-old test pilot Alan Shepard was already soaking wet. Zipped into a rubberized spacesuit and sitting on his back in a black metal cone the size of a phone booth, Shepard had waited patiently since 5.15 a.m. for the ignition of the rocket upon which his spacecraft, Freedom 7, was bolted but weather conditions and computer problems had already delayed his launch by nearly four hours. Barely able to do more than shift his weight from one side of his molded seat to the other, Shepard gazed at the assemblage of controls and indicators around him, including a periscope through which he could see the troublesome clouds swirling about his capsule. It was not anticipation, worry, or even the Florida heat that filled Shepard's suit with moisture, though, but a bladder that could find no relief in a spaceship without a toilet, designed for a 20-minute flight into space. Unwilling to leave his perch and postpone the critical mission, Shepard had urinated in his suit, and undaunted by the prospect of rocketing into space while floating on a puddle of his own pee, called out to launch control to, quote, light this candle. At 9.34 a.m. on May 5th, 1961, Shepard's command was followed, and the Navy Lieutenant Commander became the first American to reach space atop a Redstone liquid fuel rocket that fired its engine for two and a half minutes, lobbing Shepard's Project Mercury spacecraft in a weightless arc 115 miles into the sky before sending it hurtling, it, sending it hurtling back through the atmosphere. The flight offered only a few precious minutes to maneuver the craft. Shepard could see the curvature of the Earth's surface against the blackness of space, but the mission schedule of experiments and tests offered no time for sightseeing, and automated cameras took all of the photographs. Almost as soon as the flight had begun, it was over, with the craft dangling by parachute before striking the Atlantic Ocean. Recovered by helicopter, Shepard found himself aboard the aircraft carrier USS Lake Champlain, recounting the events of his mission, alert, lucid, finally dry, and no worse for wear. From Shepard's calm demeanor, one would never suspect that he was the very first American to accomplish this feat, the first to ride a rocket into space, and the first to return. In a matter of minutes, Shepard's short flight had demonstrated the ability of the United States to launch people into space and gave the nation the confidence to dream bigger.
Though brief, Shepard's flight had been no easy task. It was years in the making, with planning for it beginning before the U.S. Congress established the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1958, and even before the Soviet Union's launch of the first artificial Earth satellite, Sputnik 1, in 1957. Two presidential administrations and a host of government agencies and private contractors had worked furiously for nearly a decade to achieve what was expected to be one of the most important technical milestones of the post-war era, piloted flight into space via rocket. Success in the endeavor would bring accolades and influence for the nations that achieved it, perhaps tipping the scales in the competition between superpowers without resort to war. The type of launch vehicle and spacecraft Shepard flew had carried chimpanzee ham into space in January of 1961, after which Shepard desperately sought to fly aboard the next test flight in March. First the chimp, veteran test pilots joked, then the chump. Indeed, Shepard's piloting skills would not be required in the mostly automated capsule, but he would use them nonetheless to prove that humans could pilot spacecraft and need not serve as mere passengers on future space missions. NASA's engineers, concerned about the performance of the Redstone, refused, pushing Shepard to a May launch in a decision that had unexpected consequences. Three weeks before Shepard's May 5th flight, Soviet state media announced that cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin had become the first human to fly in space by making a single 90-minute orbit around the Earth. Details about the mission were scant, and the Soviets had concealed that Gagarin, in one important sense, had not actually succeeded. In parachuting from his Vostok capsule rather than landing on the Earth within it, Gagarin had violated international rules regarding flight records, depriving him of the title of the first human in space if anyone in the West ever found out about the deception. Though the honor properly fell to Shepard, Gagarin entered the rep record books as the first space pioneer, with a voyage that seemed far more impressive than Shepard's short suborbital hop. In fact, Gagarin's orbital voyage had required only a more powerful launch vehicle than Shepard's Redstone, not a superior spacecraft or pilot, and NASA would soon send its Mercury spacecraft into orbit atop the new Atlas launch vehicle. Shepard's success, though, was the first step and gave President John F. Kennedy the confidence to announce, only 20 days later, America's goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth by 1970 the endeavor that defined the space race of the 1960s. In completing his mission so well, Shepard became something of an archetype for American astronauts to follow, especially after an inner ear disorder grounded him and left him to run NASA's astronaut office alongside fellow grounded comrade Donald Deke Slayton. Supervising the recruitment, selection, training, and assignment of new astronauts, they helped to define the often inexplicable set of qualifications required of those seeking the opportunity to voyage into space. Shepard had been, in NASA's estimation, the best of the original seven pilots selected in 1959 to fly in Project Mercury, but all were accomplished aviators, bright, ambitious, and most of all, healthy. Selecting these men from the 110 shortlisted candidates fell to several individuals, including Harvard-trained physicians like Dr. Charles Berry, who treated astronauts throughout his career at NASA. The first would-be astronauts who NASA solicited for their participation in the space program were almost all in active military service at the time, and many interpreted the secret communications they received to be interviewed for the project as orders rather than invitations. The first 69 invited to interview concealed their misgivings and responded enthusiastically to the opportunity. After a battery of questions and psychological examinations in Washington, D.C., 32 finalists were sent for medical tests in New Mexico, conducted by aviation physicians unsure what exactly they were looking for. NASA has selected over 300 astronauts in its history, choosing a handful from thousands of applicants every few years beginning in 1959, with the original seven astronauts of Project Mercury casting a long shadow over the competitions. The process NASA employs for selecting astronauts has changed somewhat in the last 60 years. The grueling and sometimes absurd medical tests inflicted on applicants have been greatly reduced in number and duration but the process remains, uh, retains many of its key aspects, including its emphasis on technical achievement, athleticism, and an affable confidence Tom Wolfe described as the right stuff. 
where this quality was once believed to exist only in male white military test pilots, the only people able to receive the credentials necessary to even compete in the selections, the modern NASA astronaut corps is more representative of the nation as a whole and extends opportunities, not just to pilots, uh, but to civilian physicians, scientists, and engineers. While a small number of astronauts are likely to be recruited in the coming years by private companies engaged in spacecraft development work, the most assured path to space still lies with NASA, a US government agency that follows civil service rules regarding hiring. The selection of the Project Mercury astronauts was conducted in secret, but these days, if you would like to become an astronaut, you don't have to wait to be nominated. You can write to this address, which probably won't get you very far, as NASA does not accept unsolicited application materials. A better strategy is to wait and check the web, especially usajobs.gov, um, which lists, among other opportunities, NASA's job advertisements for future space crews, most recently last year. You may be wondering if you need to be a military pilot or indeed any kind of pilot in order to be considered. But this is not the case, although having flying experience generally helps and can give you more chances to win a coveted slot. The earliest astronauts were all pilots and were expected to fly their space vehicles, and NASA still recruits highly qualified, qualified airplane pilots for the role, which, among other benefits, uh, provides a pathway to command of a mission. Only the most accomplished pilots will succeed in this application track, and those candidates usually have postgraduate engineering training and exemplary military service records as test pilots of high performance jet aircraft. A more likely route to space for most applicants is the science and engineering track. Astronauts who will not fly space vehicles, but will perform spacewalks and mission experiments. NASA started accepting candidates like these in 1965 and relaxed the rules substantially in 1978, opening this track to people without piloting experience and no plan to get any. In practice, many of even these applicants have military or piloting experience, perhaps not enough for the piloting track, but usually combine it with advanced degrees in medicine, physics or engineering, among other disciplines, and often multiple degrees and credentials. NASA has uh, no need for non-scientific professionals at this point. So all of you historians and lawyers and accountants will need to find some other way to reach space. The plans to launch journalists and artists into space never quite off the ground, got off the ground, but educators have been a tiny part of the program ever since the early 1980s, although they are rarely flown, especially given the loss of Krista McAuliffe in the Challenger disaster in 1986. The good news, though, is that provided you are in good help, health, there are no set age limits and most people are probably fit enough to fly in space. Although with 10,000 or more applications received for every astronaut selection, NASA seldom picks people who meet only the minimum qualifications. Astronauts, once selected, are federal civil service employees who will earn a salary prescribed by federal regulations or their military pay if detailed to NASA from their respective service branches. If your plan is to become rich by being an astronaut, then you will not succeed. A few astronauts have traded on their celebrity and or made wise investments, but this work is no path to wealth. What about space mining, you might ask? Well, I hate to tell you, but even if the moon were made entirely of gold, it could not be profitably mined with the gold returned to Earth with the technology we have today. Bringing it back would always cost more than it is worth. So don't plan on striking it rich during any of your voyages. No worries, you are no doubt saying to yourself. The chance to fly in space is something that I would gladly even receive a pittance for. Fine, but the chance to do that is still a closely guarded opportunity. And even if you are credentialed, healthy and willing, you will need to convince people that you belong in space instead of the equally accomplished applicant sitting next to you. What are these people looking for? Who is the perfect astronaut? To NASA's astronaut engineers in 1959, probably something like this. Veteran test pilots mocked astronauts like Shepard uh, as spam in the can, a pinkish lunch meat stuffed in a metal box with little to do. At first, this conception of the spacefarer wasn't too far off the mark. NASA physiologists debated sedating astronauts before their flights as Project Mercury would principally test man's ability to survive uh, flight into space, not necessarily even his ability to do very much while he was there. 
Even before Mercury began, though, Air Force experts and others began to advance a more elaborate notion of the spacefarer, imagining them to be calm and confident managers of stressful situations. We must find those who are experienced observers, who have demonstrated cool-headedness and resourcefulness, who have good intelligence, who can tolerate physical punishment, and who are stable, calm, and confident. We must reject those who, although able to give a good account of themselves, do so primarily to prove something to themselves or the world. In the United States, this idea of the astronaut took root and structured expectations for the space program for the next six decades. Despite the elaborate examinations conducted on astronaut applicants, the interview conducted by existing astronauts has traditionally been the most important part of the selection process. Unlike an academic exam, technical questions aren't a priority, but rather queries aimed at elucidating character. What are the questions like? One common question asks applicants for something they do better than anyone else on Earth. The only wrong answer is no answer at all. Right answers can be odd or even intimidating. One successful applicant, a former Navy SEAL, answered, quote, kill with a knife. Not a skill required for space flight, but an expression of self-assuredness that impressed his examiners. If you make it through the multiple rounds of competitions and selections, you will have arrived in a strange kind of monastic order, um, but to be sure at the very bottom of it. Until astronauts complete their training and to some veterans fly their first mission, new arrivals are mere astronaut candidates or ASCANs for short, a term intended to be pejorative. Earning the respect of fellow astronauts is the ticket to advancement. And for new ASCANs, this means excelling in training that might, depending on luck, take years, just a few if you are lucky and a decade if you are not. What will this training look like? Much of it will take the form of classroom instruction and spaceflight basics. These courses aren't graded because astronauts hate being ranked against each other. Some of the training will be in the field, much of it a lot of fun. Most human space vehicles operate in orbits that pass over virtually every ecosystem on Earth, which means that an accident or problem could result in space vehicles returning to Earth at sea, in forests, on tundra, or in deserts. At least some part of astronaut training, and generally the part ASCANs enjoy the most, is spent learning the techniques of, to survive in harsh environments. But since most of the Earth's surface is covered with water, not sand, most American spacecraft and have landed in or near it, and military water survival training is mandatory for astronauts, as is scuba training, as it is the closest terrestrial analog to being in space. If you were assigned to conduct a spacewalk or extravehicular activity, EVA, you will spend time in the pool fully suited up because floating is one of the best ways to practice experiencing some of the feelings of weightlessness you will encounter in orbit as your spaceship falls in a circular uh, path around the Earth's rounded surface. True weightlessness feels like that weird sensation you get jumping off of a high diving board. Neutral buoyancy in swimming pools is not a perfect simulation of weightlessness because you will still perceive an up and a down, but your body will move in a, in a, in a way similar to that uh, will, uh, in which it will float while in orbit. There is sadly no static environment on Earth that can mimic true weightlessness, no chamber or centrifuge. The only way to experience true weightlessness is by riding in an airplane conducting a series of climbs and dives, which when done properly, will give passengers and crew about a minute of weightless conditions at a time, enough to experience some of the sensations of space flight without going into space. This is one of the few aspects of astronaut training that anyone can, for enough money, enjoy as a private citizen, and a variety of companies offer these kinds of rides now. Astronaut training, though, is not all fun and games. You will need to become familiar with equipment, and if you are a pilot, practice flying aircraft that simulate the performance of spacecraft. Any astronaut who will interact with the spacecraft will also utilize ground-based simulators. You will literally spend weeks on end in these devices, which will test not only your mastery of the skills you will need on your mission, but your ability to work with others and manage emergencies. These simulators have become more sophisticated over the years, but are still challenging devices designed to reveal flaws in your preparation, and you will grow to love and hate them in equal measure. Astronauts crash simulators, sometimes accidentally and sometimes on purpose, but mostly astronauts try to do well in them and never quite feel that they've done well enough.
Don't be surprised if you feel like you haven't reached the level of expertise you imagined you'd have. Space vehicles are complex machines, and they can't be mastered on memory alone. Recently deceased astronaut Michael Collins, command module pilot of the 1969 Apollo 11 moon landing mission, later remarked that he couldn't say how long he had trained, estimating that he had devoted his entire three-year career at NASA to the, to the task and more. Quote, for six months, I had been training specifically for Gemini 10 with its peculiar EVA and rendezvous problems. But this period had, of course, been preceded by six months of Gemini basic training during my tenure as backup for Gemini 7. But how about all the basic grubby training with its emphasis on orbital mechanics, or the jungle training, or the centrifuge, or the zero-G airplane, or pressure suit work? Or what I learned in test flying at Edwards, or ejecting from a smoke-filled cockpit years before? Or the math I learned in school, the foundation upon which orbital mechanics was built? I just don't know how long it takes, except that it has taken me 35 years to reach crew quarters. Being in space is scary. Nothing you do to train will likely make it any less so. The good news is that you will probably not be very scared. Astronauts fall back on their training during stressful times and have, historically, been more likely to obsess over mistakes they've made than their physical safety. That said, space is still dangerous. Collins reported being mildly worried throughout his flight, not just for his own safety, but also for that of his crewmates, Neil Armstrong and Edwin Buzz Aldrin, who he feared would make it to the lunar surface, but be unable to return. To be in a spacecraft is to know that just outside a thin wall of aluminum lies a frozen vacuum that can turn you into a popsicle in seconds. While some astronauts have worried about hatches opening or bulkheads failing, it's good to remember that the walls of your blood vessels are far thinner than the walls of a spaceship, and you rely on them to keep your cardiovascular system intact, which may be the creepiest thing that I will say throughout this entire talk. Will you survive in your first flight into space? Maybe, probably, really. Astronauts, like other people with dangerous jobs, sometimes die in the course of their duties, but fatalities are relatively rare. Space flying was probably most dangerous in the early 1960s, when training and mission accidents were more common. Of the 26 NASA astronauts active in 1964, 27% were dead within three years. This record is comparable to the losses encountered in test piloting work or combat flying. And while the numbers have come down in recent years, space flight is not safe and won't be for a long time. Astronauts die in all kinds of ways because they are surrounded by dangerous and often experimental technologies that sometimes fail, and they occasionally make mistakes. Airplane crashes during proficiency training were common in NASA's early decades, and fires on the ground killed both astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts. Deaths aboard space vehicles have occurred as well in Russia, and um, great losses um, of crews in the United States, uh, particularly the loss of space shuttle crews in 1986 and 2003. And sadly, some spacefarers have returned to Earth dead, but in intact spacecraft that failed in some way in flight. The only assurance I can give you is that if you do die in space, NASA will do everything it can to bring your body back to Earth not only because it is tradition or the right thing to do, but because the prospect of a dead astronaut in orbit is very unpleasant. This conversation is perhaps less fun than you were hoping for, but these are the sorts of things you'll have to think about if you actually want to go into space. Most likely, you will be neither terrified nor dead in space, but you will have feelings and spaceflight may be strange for you. Upon leaving Earth, many first-time astronauts are struck with feelings of homesickness and alienation. Looking out of the window at Earth often causes spontaneous bursts of, a, of emotion, especially weeping. Don't be afraid if this happens. It's pretty normal and nobody will make fun of you. And crying a little is much better than some of the other reactions that people have to spaceflight. You've probably heard of space adaptation syndrome or space sickness. And even if you've trained well for your job, there is a fair chance, maybe one in three or one in two, that you will find yourself vomiting uncontrollably for about a day and a half once you arrive in orbit. Exactly why this happens is still something of a mystery, but weightlessness interferes with your body's vestibular system and alters blood flow to your digestive tract, which is a bad combination. We can produce some of the sensations of space sickness and screen for those persons who are particularly vulnerable using a rotating litter chair like this. When rotated in the chair, blindfolded, some people become very nauseous when tipping their head from side to side, a good predictor of space sickness vulnerability. 
space sickness vulnerability may keep you from flying and in the past has shortened astronaut careers. Because barfing in space isn't just messy and smelly, it's potentially life-threatening, especially if it happens in a spacesuit. Vomited material will float in space and the risk of it obstructing vision or being aspirated is very high. Which brings us to a question you've probably all been expecting. And that is whether you will have to wear a spacesuit all the time in space, which may seem either really cool or very uncomfortable, depending on your perspective. Astronauts haven't always traveled into space wearing pressure suits, but on most flights, they provide a measure of redundancy and safety in the event that cabin pressurization fails. A number of fatalities have occurred on space missions when the suits weren't used, so some kind of redundant protective garment is commonplace for launch, landing, and various other dangerous parts of a space flight, like docking and undocking. No spacesuit has ever truly been comfortable, and for a lot of you, I suspect wearing one may be a deal breaker. The feelings of enclosure and entrapment that these miniature spacecraft produce can be very jarring. Before you throw in the towel, it might be useful to know that spacesuits generally aren't any more uncomfortable than the clothing many women wore throughout the 20th century and often still do. The components of modern spacesuits, neoprene, lycra, and other materials are derived from the women's clothing industry and were built by the same manufacturers. Um, spacesuits are designed like women's foundations to fit as closely to the body as possible. In fact, during the 1950s, undergarment makers like Berger Brothers and David Clark experienced with what they called the, quote, weight supporting problem, found new markets in making aviation apparel designed to contain pressures and control forces on the body during flight. The earliest of these garments were virtual duplicates of women's underwear dyed olive green. They ranged from anti-G suits designed to present, prevent blood from pooling in the lower extremities to pressure suits supporting bodily tissues at high altitudes using the same combinations of zippers and corsetry, or corsetry found in women's garments. Male pilots sometimes complained about these skin tight garments, but they squeezed less and probably moved more than women's fashions of the period. On one occasion, the lack of availability of a suitable analog led the next American astronaut to fly after Shepard, Gus Grissom, to be launched into space in a panty girdle um, to stabilize the urine collection apparatus he wore under his pressure suit. Um, he didn't really mind. As far as he was concerned, it was the least objectionable thing he had had to do in order to become an astronaut. Of course, Acclimating to a spacesuit is only the first step to securing an opportunity to do one of the best things one can do in space, and that is EVA. You might have a chance to perform a spacewalk if you are not on the pilot track, but EVAs aren't frequent and competition is stiff. If you do get the chance, you will pre-breathe pure oxygen for an hour, prepare your suit, enter an airlock, and float in space for a few hours, admiring Earth and, more importantly, trying to build or fix something, which is a lot trickier to do in space than it is on Earth. If you don't hold on to something, you will float away, and if you push too hard against an object, you will float away. And if your suit develops a leak, you will also float away. Basically, everything you do in space will cause you to float away. Astronauts sometimes have jetpacks to help them maneuver and deal with emergencies, but the fuel contained within them is very limited, and you won't be zipping around the sky as much as you might hope. But mostly, you'll be holding on uh, to tethers that will be attached to your suit. The key to working in weightlessness is slow, deliberate movements. Otherwise, you will quickly become exhausted. And there's nothing that makes a person move slowly in space. When we see film or television of people moving slowly in space, it's because they recognize that slow movements are the key to moving well. Because your rubberized suit will resist the movement of your limbs, every movement will require effort. And it's not uncommon for the pressure on astronauts' fingertips to cause them to lose their fingernails over time. EVAs, uh, especially the very rare untethered ones, are a lot of fun, but they are athletic experiences for which you will need to train a great deal. Of course, there's always a risk that your suit will fail in some way, and failures have happened, but they are not routine occurrences. The most recent one involved water from a coolant line leaking into the suit and filling the helmet with water, which is a very serious emergency. If you are worried that your helmet will just pop off, though, you need not be. This has never happened, and even if it did, your head would not explode. More likely, it would do something like this, and yes, this is, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger from Total Recall. Um, 
a film that is surprisingly technically accurate because any gas and fluid filled cavities in your body would immediately start to ex uh, expand in a vacuum or near vacuum. Your face would swell and your eyes would bulge and you would get very, very cold very, very quickly. Um, you would probably be conscious for about 10 seconds, but after that you would be in very bad shape and probably be dead within a minute. Within that period though, your crewmates would rescue you because astronauts never spacewalk alone. Since spacewalks can last eight hours or more, you may be wondering how you will eat, drink, and excrete while you, in your, you are in your spacesuit. And the answer, I'm afraid, will not please you. Absorbent garments are the norm for spacesuit toileting, and other technologies generally don't wor work nearly as well. NASA has tried to improve on commercial diapers, but hasn't really been able to do so. Once safely inside your spacecraft, there's a good chance that a toilet of some kind will be available for your use, but they don't work exactly the way they do on Earth and are known for their mechanical unreliability. Uh, if sharing this device with your crewmates makes you uncomfortable, don't worry, certain parts are actually swapped out for each user. The device itself isn't much fun to use and women have often encountered problems with it. On the space shuttle, urinating into a towel generally was the easiest way to excrete, but be careful. In space, surface tension forces liquids into droplets that float freely throughout the cabin until they hit something. So unless you want to spend your time cleaning up, make sure that liquids go exactly where they should as soon as they are produced. This fact precludes normal bathing and washing in space, um, which as it turns out is, is basically virtually impossible in weightless conditions. On the largest American space vehicle, Skylab, astronauts used an experimental shower to contain wayward water, but it didn't work very well. And space baths these days are washcloth affairs that never leave anyone feeling too clean. When it comes to eating in space, Comfort will, again, take a backseat to efficiency and the limits of the space environment. Spacesuits won't give you the flexibility to withdraw your arms back into the suit, so if it's not already in your helmet, you can't eat it. Space helmets sometimes include special ports for water hoses or self-contained water pouches and energy bars for snacking, but solid meals will have to wait until you are safely back aboard your spacecraft. Even there, though, most of the food you encounter will displease you for a couple of good reasons. Spacecraft don't have ovens, freezers, or even refrigerators because these appliances weigh too much and take up too much space, and cooking anything in space poses a significant fire risk. Instead, you'll enjoy shelf storable food and the occasional off-the-shelf product. Any fresh food you bring with you won't last, and certain things like the corned beef sandwich astronaut John Young brought into space in 1965 may produce crumbs that will float away and dirty up the cockpit. Even if you had good food, though, it might not taste the same in space, as weightlessness tends to clog the sinuses and prevent astronauts from smelling and tasting their food properly. Water provided on spacecraft is often produced in fuel cells that leave a lot of dissolved oxygen, giving crew members flatulence that can be painful at times. Nobody gains weight in space. Shepard's flight was too short to require nutrition. The only food aboard Freedom 7 was survival food intended to be consumed after landing. An American didn't eat food in space until John Glenn's orbital mercury flight the following year. And while space flight proved uh, to offer no impediment to swallowing and digestion, the food he brought with him was terrible. Some foods were chopped into cubes and covered with wax, which made them tasteless while others were pureed and put into toothpaste tubes, which were later abandoned because of their excessive weight. Plastic bags of dehydrated foods became the norm beginning with Apollo, as water was relatively plentiful on the spacecraft, and food could be stored more compactly um, when it was dried out first. Later American space vehicles experimented with canned items, and Skylab astronauts even enjoyed fresh baked bread. Well, Bread baked into a sealed can, uh, which would be reasonable, free, reasonably fresh when it was opened. Improvement in these meals has been minimal over time, in part due to the lack of refrigeration and cooking devices. Because much of the food is stored at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, fruit delivered to the International Space Station rots within a couple of days, with bananas probably being the least shelf-stable. Instant tea and coffee hydrate reasonably well in space, but experiments in the 1980s to bring soda aboard the space shuttle ended unsuccessfully, in part due to the lack of refrigeration. Uh, you can imagine what it would be like to drink, drink uh, warm soda uh, in an environment of painful flatulence. 
If you are hoping to drink alcohol in space, you will be disappointed, uh, as it is forbidden on U.S. space vehicles, but a variety of, sor of sources suggest that not only has alcohol been brought aboard Russian spacecraft, but that crew members have actually gotten drunk in space from time to time. Whether tipsy or not, though, you will eventually go to sleep, which in space is a little harder than it sounds. Uh, space vehicles can provide rooms to all crew members, so sleeping with the lights on and people milling about is the norm. The standard sleep technology is a bag of sorts strapped to any surface large enough to hold it. Walls, floors, and ceilings are interchangeable in space, and any room can be a bedroom. In space, the body assumes a relaxed position with limbs bent, but your sleeping bag will create gentle pressure to replace the absent force of gravity, inducing the feeling of sleeping on a soft mattress. In weightlessness, though, it is not uncommon to dream that you are falling, which of course you are, only you never actually hit the ground in both your dream and in real life. This can be a little disconcerting. In case you were wondering, these sleeping bags are only intended for one person, and despite endless speculation, we have no evidence that anyone has ever experienced sexuality of any kind in space. While opportunities for sexual pairings have occurred, even among a pair of secretly married space shuttle astronauts in 1992, we know of no encounters and even masturbation seems to be somewhat uncommon. After returning from his visit aboard Skylab in 1974, astronaut Ed Gibson dismissed the idea, mostly due to the lack of privacy, energy, and time available on most space missions. With all of the stresses placed upon the body and mind during spaceflight, you might wonder if it will be just too much for you. On that front, I have good news. Though described in popular culture for decades, space madness, as we might call it, doesn't actually exist. Astronauts can sometimes become ecstatic about the space environment or cranky when asked to do too much, but depression, psychosis, and religious mania during missions is uncommon. Um, space flight appeared to be hard on marriages, but mostly because taboos about divorce during the 1960s kept unhappy astronauts and their spouses married to each other long after they would have otherwise divorced. Viewing Earth from the cupola aboard the ISS may give you some sniffles, but the emotional trauma some people associate with space exploration is a product of professional dissatisfaction upon the return of astronauts to Earth, not the stresses of traveling in space. This is a good thing, as the only treatment for transient psychosis in space is limited to haloperidol. And as with any health emergency, the goal is to return people to the ground as quickly as possible for proper medical intervention, no matter what the cause. The emotional impact of spaceflight is a long-term problem. You may well find after you return from space that nothing you do feels quite as exciting. And the fact that you can't just let go of your toothbrush in midair and have it just stay there will probably be a source of endless disappointment. Most astronauts adjust, but Buzz Aldrin suffered from depression and alcoholism after walking on the moon, and others went to great lengths to fly again. Your body, in fact, may be your worst enemy in this effort, and astronauts are notoriously shy around medical professionals who have the power to ground them if they are unwell. This is, in fact, what happened to Alan Shepard after returning to Earth. After being grounded in 1963 with Meniere's disease, he was barred from flying in space. Fortunately for Shepard, though, an experimental surgical procedure resolved his symptoms and Shepard received command of Apollo 14, reaching the moon a decade after the flight of Freedom 7 and ending his astronaut career by walking on the lunar surface, one of only 12 human beings to have had that honor. Shepard died of leukemia in 1998. The earliest astronauts, like Shepard, enjoyed a certain celebrity that both expanded their post-flight career options and created a certain amount of pressure on them and their families. You probably won't become famous as an astronaut, but that's okay because being an astronaut has its own rewards, though they are bought with a significant amount of personal and professional sacrifice. Not only will you need to relocate and spend a lot of time away from home, but whatever career you had before you became an astronaut will likely end or be transitioned into or transformed into something else. Astronaut, as Shepard used to tell new Ascans, was a job that one did 24 hours a day. Before I end my remarks, I should dispatch a couple of other questions you may be afraid to ask. First, what about aliens? <laughs> 
Uh, you need not worry about meeting any in your interstellar travels, because while odds are there's some kind of life elsewhere in the universe, any planet that could support a spacefaring civilization is likely so far away from us that its inhabitants are unlikely to find you. Our closest stellar neighbor would take maybe 25,000 years to reach Earth using the propulsion technology that we and presumably they understand. And we must, we must be careful assuming that extraterrestrials are any smarter than we are. Our only hope of reaching these distant worlds is through radio signals, which themselves will take decades or centuries to reach other habitable worlds. Some other questions that may be on your minds. You are probably wondering whether all of the monkeys we shot into space came back super intelligent. The answer is yes. Well, that's enough for now. Go explore space, like Alan Shepard, but don't complain to me if you don't like it. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you, Matthew. So we have a question from, from Henry. Uh, he says, will, Americans, will, will the American space program ever return to the adventurous days of old? Thank you very much. I think it's a very interesting question because it really goes to the heart about what space exploration and particularly government sponsored space exploration is supposed to mean in the United States. Uh, NASA, when it was chartered in 1958, was chartered as a peaceful scientific agency to basically do all the kinds of exploration for which there's really no immediate profit potential. All of the really interesting, dangerous, exciting work with the idea that once this happened, um, routine travel into space would be taken over by private companies and common carriers, very much in the way that uh, passenger aviation took off in the United States. So we have a situation in which NASA itself has been chartered to be daring and dramatic. Um, however, it is also a government agency that has its funding determined by political bodies who may be more or less disposed to its goals. And this has always created a problem for NASA and particularly created one following the moon landing as NASA struggled to figure out what it could do next that the government was willing to support. And by that, I mean by the taxpayers, and because as it turns out, um, uh, surveys conducted immediately after the moon landings of the early 1970s and somewhat later indicated virtually no public support for returns for return to the moon or even travel to Mars or even the establishment of a permanent space station. Um, most of the people who were interested in, in pursuing space exploration uh, by the United States government were hoping that it would help solve the environmental crisis. We assume that there's a vast wellspring of support um, for major um, investigations of the outer planets for travel into space. But it's always been a very, very shallow mandate. And NASA does a remarkable amount uh, of really good work with the limited political mandate that it actually has. Um, whether we will be more daring in the future, I certainly hope so. I would love to see us visit an asteroid. I see no really good reason for us to return to the moon necessarily. Uh, it's more of a stumbling back block than a, the, a way station to the stars. Uh, and eventually human beings will venture to Mars and elsewhere, but we probably don't know how to do that safely. Uh, one of the great things I love to say, though, about being an historian is that I'm not responsible for making predictive statements about the future. Uh, so your guess is as good as mine. So we have a, a question from uh, from Chloe. Could you talk a little bit more about the development of space suits and space clothing over the past few decades? Has there been any significant advancement or changes? This is a fascinating story. The spacesuit was something that was first articulated in American science fiction by an author named Garrett Service, who wrote a serialized sci-fi novel called Edison's Conquest of Mars, which is his answer to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, in which Thomas Edison develops an anti-gravity substance, uh, builds a spaceship, and invents spacesuits so that uh, Americans can fly to Mars and defeat the Martians on their home turf. Uh, people actually started to build these devices uh, in the 1920s and 1930s to support high altitude aviation. And it's a really, really tricky technical problem. Um, most of these spacesuits um, rely upon some kind of gas bladder, something that can hold an Earth-like or similar atmosphere so that a person can breathe. Um, but these substances tend to be rubberized, and as a result, space suits, space suits, once they're inflated, tend to expand, which means on top of this gas bladder layer, you need to some kind of restraint layer to hold the gas bladder in. Um, still, though, trying to get into one of these things with an airtight seal and a helmet that you can see out of and actually move around in when it's inflated is actually very, very challenging. Um, there have been some new work, particularly recently done at MIT, involving mechanical counterpressure. Uh, and this is a kind of spacesuit that uh, substitutes the gas bladder for an extremely tight garment that squeezes the body um, to replace the loss of atmospheric pressure. 
uh, one of the slides that I showed was actually a picture of a partial pressure suit made by uh, the Spencer Corset Company um, that was actually very much based on women's undergarments with the idea of squeezing as much of the body as possible to make up for the loss of pressure. There's still some interesting problems associated with creating an environment in which a person can breathe. Um, but this is a, a kind of suit that people are very much interested in the future because large bulky suits with limited mobility just won't work if we want to explore, for example, the surface of Mars or other environments. And at the same time, there are people who have been working aggressively on hard suits suits that kind of look like um, a lobster shell with many articulated joints, which should be extremely sturdy and have one great advantage, and that is that the mobility of them is excellent because they are constant volume suits. No matter how much you move your arms and legs, the internal volume of the suit doesn't change, so you don't have an increase in pressure every time you try to move your arms and legs. And what we're looking at right now are a series of uh, tests and competitions to determine what the next generation of spacesuits will likely look like, and people have embraced basically all of these designs, the traditional gas bladders, the hard suits, as well as the mechanical counterpressure suits. Um, no one has ever worn a spacesuit for an extended period of time on a place like the Moon or Mars. And we don't really know what's going to happen to these delicate joints or to these materials with repeated exposure to uh, temperature extreme, extremes, radiation, and dust. So this very much represents a new and very exciting area of engineering research. Excellent. We have a, a couple of questions. Um about kind of the international picture, um, either the ways that um, that space um, astronaut programs in other other countries are different, or movement of astronauts, either um, non-U.S. citizens in the in the U.S. program, or vice versa. Absolutely. Uh, one of the exciting things uh, that we study in history of technology is the concept of regional styles. The idea that in a in a different context, in a different culture, in a different nation. Um, people may try to solve technological problems in a different way. Um, we saw, for example, that in the Soviet Union, um, the selection of astronauts was slightly different. Instead of choosing basically mid-level, highly experienced test pilots, um, the Soviet space program largely chose very junior, very inexperienced pilots, many of whom were just out of flight training, because uh, they were principally interested in people who will, would be very malleable and follow orders. And they did not necessarily want their astronauts, their cosmonauts, to participate as members of any engineering design teams on the vehicles. Um, the engineering um, leaders of the Soviet space program had much more control uh, than their American counterparts over the direction of their program. In the United States, um, it was hoped, following the procedures normally used in flight test operations, that the pilots themselves would play an active role in engineering. Um, in other space programs that we've seen come along, we've seen some very interesting things. Uh, the Chinese space program is a fascinating one, in part because uh, the Chinese space program appears to have spent more time considering issues of psychological compatibility um, uh, among their, their taikonauts, as they're called. Um, a lot of work has been done to figure out whether crews are, are emotionally and psychologically compatible and will be able to work together. This is an area that was largely ignored by the United States and its space program for literally decades. In between around 1964 and 1987, there was virtually no NASA or NASA-supported work um, of figuring out the uh, emotional or psychological health or compatibility of its crews. And astronauts claimed that they were so focused on the mission that they'd be able to get along with anybody. Um, but however, we do know for a fact uh, that several astronauts were in fact shuffled or replaced on missions because they just didn't get along with others. Um, so uh, we can see in other uh, countries that develop different space programs, a different kind of emphasis on psychological compatibility, different degrees of training or skill that are required, or space programs that might um, pick mostly um, scientists and engineers and physicians and rely principally on automation for the piloting associated with spaceflight. So um, I have a question from uh, Anne. Uh, says, could you say a little, a little bit about the women, uh, women's astronaut selection effort uh, from 1959 to 1960, now known as Mercury 13? Yes. Um, one of the major questions that I know arose originally it was the um, the really secretive and private selection of astronauts um, in, in 1959. Actually, quite just a bit before the Mercury selection. The, um, is the Federal Register actually published a brief announcement for a civil service search for astronaut research candidates, um, uh, which was only out in public for about a couple of weeks before it got shut down and replaced with a private search. Um, the determination was made by actually President Eisenhower himself 
um, that the first people to be selected as astronauts should be existing military test pilots. He basically argued that the nation basically owed them for their service. Plus, they were a very convenient group of people to work with. Um, they were already familiar with secrecy regimes. They would move anywhere you told them, and they accepted all the risks associated with the program. Uh, this was a problem, though, because in order to become a military test pilot in the United States, you had to be a man at that time. There were, there were also um, virtually no non-whites in the piloting track at this particular point. So it guaranteed a certain kind of ethnic and demographic makeup for the early astronaut corps. And this was a source of, of significant problems for the United States um, politically, um, uh, especially in, after 1963, when the Soviets launched Valentina Tereshkova into space, the, the first woman in space. Um, uh, NASA was forced to defend um, this, uh, this men-only exclusionary policy, uh, and its efforts to do so were not very, not very successful. Um, uh, even such luminaries as John Glenn uh, defended the exclusion, arguing that if we wanted to beat the Russians to the moon first, we had to use the best available talent, and we just couldn't take the time to teach anybody else to learn what they needed to know to fly. But the truth is that lying behind this was a great deal of misogyny. In fact, one of the, one of the most horrible things that were said at the time uh, was when asked whether or not um, women would be uh, permitted to fly in space vehicles, uh, uh, German-born uh, uh, space vehicle designer Werner von Braun uh, said in response that the male astronauts would be allowed to bring into space 100 pounds of recreational equipment, which tells you what kind of attitudes we're looking at back then when it came to the question of women flying in space. Um, within NASA and its orbit, effectively, large numbers of people thought that women actually would be an excellent choice for flying into space because they weighed less and they took up less space and didn't breathe as much, much oxygen. And many were already trained pilots. So in fact, um, uh, Alan Loveless, uh, one of the key contractors for NASA who conducted the medical examinations of astronauts, um, conducted at the same time a series of tests uh, aimed uh, at trying to identify women aviators who could um, pass uh, the medical screening qualifications and be offered to NASA as potential women astronauts. Um, unfortunately, this effort never had official NASA sanction. And when NASA found out about it, they pulled a plug on it, as did the Navy, which was be involved in some of the testing, particularly centrifuge testing. So this effort to recruit women astronauts as early as 1961 failed, although there have been some excellent books uh, written on the subject, particularly uh, my favorite by Margaret Weidekamp. Um, the uh, recruitment of women took many, many more years. In fact, it was not until 1978 that the first women uh, joined uh, NASA's space program uh, as mission specialists in the non-piloting track. Uh, since then, though, women were uh, permitted to um, uh, receive a jet piloting training and to go to test pilot uh, training schools and to work as test pilots, and since then um, have achieved all of the ranks um, from, from pilot uh, to commander um, that men have achieved. But it was a very, very long, difficult uh, road. There's a, uh, there's a very good book on this subject uh, by Amy Foster on integrating women into NASA's uh, space program. Um, and uh, this was, a, this was a, a, a problem that flummoxed NASA in a really basic level in terms of creating equipment and even clothing that would properly fit women. Uh, they had bastard travel to the moon, but they were still flummoxed to some extent by uh, broadening space vehicles in this kind of way. So, um, so we have a couple of questions about uh, SpaceX and your, your yes. thoughts about SpaceX. This, this might be a question that's come up before. Now, people often ask me about the privatization of spaceflight and whether we're li living in some kind of sort of very new moment. And as I mentioned earlier, there was always an expectation that NASA would develop technologies and then provide those technologies to private industry who would exploit them. And, and this is exactly what happened in the case of SpaceX. SpaceX's engine technology is based on NASA research of the 1990s um, that was provided to the company. Uh, and SpaceX is trying to fill a niche um, that was previously occupied uh, to some extent by other large uh, defense conglomerates that made launch vehicles and sold them to the United States government for various purposes. Um, we are seeing perhaps an increase in private responsibility for managing the development of space vehicles and even launching them into space. But something that we have to keep in mind is that there is no private space flight market uh, in the United States, and there won't be for some time. There's only one customer effectively, and that's the United States government. And SpaceX is competing in, in a very interesting and engaging and novel way for contracts that were previously um, uh, won by other larger entities, whether we're talking about Boeing or Lockheed or McDonnell Douglas or other space entities. Um, they're using some novel technology. They're keeping costs low. Uh, they're experimenting re with reusability in interesting ways. Um, but um, they're still trying to attract the interest of the same big customer, the same deep pocket, which is Uncle Sam. 
Um, it'll be quite some time before people have the opportunity without spending literally $60 million of figuring out a way to fly into space. There isn't necessarily a whole lot for individual or on private citizens to do or even private corporations to do in space. It's a dangerous, hostile environment in which human beings don't really do very well. Um, but um, we've always seen right from the very beginning of the space program, various corporations and various entities um, trying to um, capitalize upon the largesse of the U.S. government. Great, and I think we have, we have time maybe for, for, for one more question. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Julie, uh, that's what is your favorite aspect of space exploration to research and write about? Um, or maybe more generally, like what, what brought you to this, to, to focusing on this, this kind of topic? Oh, what a great question. And one I'm not asked very often, but the root of my work um, was a, a project that I did when I was still in graduate school, examining a group of astronauts who joined the space program in 1969. They were transferred over for a, from a military program. And as soon as they arrived in NASA, they were told that the Apollo program was coming to an end and that they would never fly. Um, and uh, this group of astronauts stayed at NASA trying to help out where they could working on uh, 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 backup uh, for space missions, helping design systems, writing checklists, helping to develop the space shuttle, and they stayed in NASA in many cases for a decade and a half, waiting for some chance to fly in the future. And, and most of them ultimately did. Um, uh, uh, they all flew uh, on the space shuttle, um, and uh, they finally were able to uh, achieve their dream. And there's something about that kind of dogged devotion uh, to flying in space that really gets me. I'm always taken with stories of people who have this notion in their head that this is something they really have to do, that they must do. And they and they are willing to give up virtually every other aspect of themselves. Um, in some cases, their relationships with others. In some cases, the work that they spent years in school doing for this one chance they have um, to achieve something which they know is going to be that important and that special, to be able to literally be on the other side of the clouds, uh, to be beyond the atmosphere to have some sense of the physicality of the universe around you. When you scratch the surface of space flight, you find a lot of true believers, um, people who think that this is something truly transformative and they want to be a part of it. And it's always, it's always a pleasure when you're an historian and you find people whose behavior is rooted in something that's not entirely rational, um, that's based on a sub-rational desire and pleasure and, and when we took, look at the early history of rocketry, when we look at the development of space vehicles, um, and even the modern practice of space flight today, we'll see a lot of people who don't really have a very good reason for liking the things that they do, they just do. And in a way, it, it, it's the relationship that I've always had with space. This is something that has been fascinating to me ever since I was two years old, and I have no idea why. Excellent. I think that is a pretty good pretty good place, place to leave it. Um, uh, so thank you so much for 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 um, for sharing these these uh, these great ideas with us and um, and this this great story and so hopefully this is some good um, uh, some good tips for for those future astronauts out there. Thank you so much, Dave, and thank you once again to the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. Uh, I've been. It's been had a, I've had a wonderful time here. Um, and uh, if you have more questions, uh, you can find me in the faculty uh, of the Department of the History of Science at Harvard University. Um, and uh, I, I'll welcome your questions. Thank you so much.